Thanks, Sinan, for introducing me. So I'm going to talk about threshold crypto systems from threshold fully homomorphic encryption. Let me now motivate you first. So uh, I want to introduce you to the characters. There are two characters, and the first character is uh, Tony Stark, and he's, he play, he'll play the role of the good guy. And there is another character, which is like uh, Thanos, and he's adversarial and like uh, very powerful. So consider this following motiva motivating example. Suppose uh, Tony wants to send across uh, some messages over a channel, and let's say he maintains no private information whatsoever. So of course, in this setting, there's, it's pointless to ask for any kind of security. But so it's essential for security to have some kind of uh, private information. So now, let's say he generates a key for an encryption scheme and uses some, some uses it somehow to to encrypt the messages before sending it over to the channel. In this uh, setting, Thanos suddenly found, finds himself in trouble because now he cannot understand what he's trying to say. But as we all know, uh, key management is a hard problem, and it's, uh, it's prone to all sorts of attacks, such as uh, side channel leaks, social hacking, human error, so on and so forth. So now if uh, Thanos gets access to this uh, key of Tony's, uh, he can understand everything, and he's happy all over again. OK, so this is the main question that we ask in this paper. Can we address this issue at more basic and fund fundamental level? And uh, this area is of that of threshold cryptography. So let's just consider uh, a naive solution first. Can we divide the key K into shares S1 through Sn and store them separately? So you have a key, and you just use a secret sharing scheme and store it across servers. Now, but note that such a dumb way of uh, secret sharing is not going to lead you anywhere, because Tony has to uh, reconstruct all these secret keys in order to do anything meaningful with it. So as an example, what Tony would like is that uh, if he wants to generate a signature, he would like to sh share these uh, partial signing keys on these servers, and then so, and the server should be able to issue you some sort of partial signatures, which Tony should be able to combine to get a signature. And more formally, we require uh, the notion of correctness, where we want that each server can independently compute on the share to generate this uh, F of SI. And these evaluation shares, uh, we, can, we should be able to combine them publicly to recover the final computation F of K. And from security, we want that it should be hard to form the final computation F of K without knowing all key shares. But in cryptography, we study uh, more fine-grained access patterns, and a classical and historical example is of that of threshold, which is T out of N access pattern. And here we want that each, from correctness, we want that each server uh, can independently compute on the share F of SI, and then any T valuation shares uh, can be publicly combined later to form the final computation. And again, from the security, what we want is that it should still be hard to form the final computation f of k without knowing tk shares. And in this example, suppose Thanos suddenly snaps and corrupts half of the servers on the Earth. He should still be in trouble uh, and not be able to break security. Let's just look at this example concretely. Let's just look at threshold signatures. Now, in this application, Tony wants uh, to have a sign on a message. Suppose he has already secret shared his uh, signature key with n servers. He should be able to relay this message to the servers and then get some kind of uh, partial signatures, which he should be later able to combine to, to recover the final signature. And um, as with all signature schemes, we would require uh, this notion to satisfy various sorts of requirements, such as unforgeability, compactness, correctness, robustness, et cetera. Another example is of threshold public key encryption. Here, um, let's say that Tony has secret share, uh, partial decryption keys to the servers, and he gets a ciphertext. He should be able to relay these ciphertexts to the servers, and then servers should be able to give out partial decryptions, which he should be able to combine to learn the message. And as with uh, all encryption schemes, you might ask for various sorts of requirements, such as CCS security, compactness, correctness, 
robustness, so on and so forth. Let me again uh, tell you that there has been tons and tons of work in this area. Um, there has been work on uh, RSA signatures, Schnorr signatures, ECDSA signatures, BLS signatures, Kramer Shoop encryption, and many other works. But um, uh, most of these works have focused on specific uh, primitives, and here we uh, would like to focus more on uh, a general framework to capture these primitives. So let me summarize our, our results. So we construct threshold FHE. Then we formalize this notion of universal thresholdizer. Then we show that we can use this universal thresholdizer to, as a general tool to construct threshold crypto systems. And then uh, we construct this universal thresholdizer from threshold FHE. And this immediately gives rise to all sorts of uh, threshold crypto systems, such as threshold signatures, CCS secure PKE, distributed PRFs, function tracing, all from LWE. And many of these uh, notions were not known uh, to construct from LWE before. So let's just recall what threshold fully homomorphic encryption is. And, and even before that, uh, let's just recall what fully homomorphic encryption is. So in homomorphic encryption, you have uh, four algorithms. There's the setup algorithm, which takes in the security parameter and it gives out uh, a key pair, a public key and a secret key. And then using the public key, you can encrypt any message to give out a ciphertext. And then uh, there's this evaluate algorithm, which takes the public key, the circuit, and bunch of ciphertext to give out an evaluated ciphertext. And then uh, you can decrypt this evaluated ciphertext using the secret key to recover the evaluated message. And we want this evaluated message to be equal to the circuit applied on M1 through MK, where uh, CTI had encrypted the message MI. And now let's just move on to threshold fully homomorphic encryption. So I'm just going to tell you what modifications we make in the syntax. So now setup, instead of just taking the security parameter, additionally takes uh, n and t, where n is the number of parties and t is the threshold. And now instead of just one key, it gives um, uh, a public key and n partial decryption keys as opposed to just one secret key. Then you can encrypt any message m using the public key as before. You can evaluate as before using public key the circuit C and, and ciphertext CT1 through CDK. And, and, uh, but here the decryption runs in two phases. The first phase is, of, is that of partial decryption, which essentially is the decentralized uh, version of decryption, which takes the partial decryption key of any party I and the evaluate ciphertext and it outputs a partial decryption. And then you should be able to combine all these partial decryptions in using the final decryption algorithm to recover M eval. And uh, we, we require some sort of correctness as in FHE and the correctness notion will just say that if I pick set of partial decryptions for some ciphertext correspond, corresponding to some set of size T, I always recover the correct output that is C of M1 through MK. Okay, so uh, now let's move on to another efficiency requirements and, so, uh, and, and it's called compactness. It just says that the size of public key, size of ciphertext, uh, size of partial decryption should not grow too much. They should, uh, they should just be small. Let's look at the security notions of uh, this primitive. So there are two notions and uh, the first notion is uh, the more intuitive one. It's, it's called semantic security, which just says that if I'm not given uh, T secret keys, if I'm given less than T secret keys, then en encryption of any message M0 should be indistinguishable from encryption of any message M1. The second one is uh, more technical, which just talks, that, uh, talks about um, that partial decryptions should not leak much too much information about the ciphertext. They should just hide the ciphertext. Just the way to capture, uh, capture this is by simulating, uh, by just showing that these partial decryption can be simulated knowing a set of T minus one secret keys and, and the message that was encrypted by the ciphertext. How do we construct this? So our starting point is uh, of that of uh, uh, GSW FHE schemes, and let me just recall the properties that we use. So in GSW, the ciphertext is a matrix of dimension L cross L, 
with entries 0 and 1. And secret key S is a vector in, uh, in ZQ to the L, where Q is some modulus. And the secret key has the following structure. The structure is that the first L minus 1 components of the secret key are random, whereas the last component is uh, the floor of Q by 2. Uh, this notion, this GSW scheme satisfies what's called as approximate eigenvector property, which is that if you have any ciphertext CT, when you decrypt it, uh, when you take multiply S with CT, what you get is message times the secret plus a noise. Here, message is the message that you were encrypt when what you had encrypted inside the ciphertext, and noise is just a small vector. So I'm, uh, I'm recalling this again on this slide. And now we observe that when you do CT1 plus CT2 and you try to multiply it with S, what you get is uh, M1 plus M2 times S plus noise. So it just can be seen that CT1 plus CT2 is homomorphic addition. And similarly, if you multiply CT1 times CT2, you observe that S times CT1 times CT2 is just M1 times M2 times S plus noise. And CD1, CD2 can be treated as evaluation, uh, multiplication of two ciphertexts. Okay, so, so now uh, this way we can uh, define decryption as follows. We just say S times CT times a public vector 0, 0, 1 transpose. And when you compute this, you get M times Q by 2 plus noise. So note that decryption is linear in S. So this immediately gives uh, rise to some sort of initial idea that maybe you can secret share this uh, secret key S into, into vectors, uh, into N shares, and then use them to compute partial decryption. So the idea is that we can Shamir secret share this, um, this secret key into S1 through Sn. And Again, I'm, I'm just going to re, uh, recall that in Shamir uh, secret sharing, if I have any set of size t, there will exist Lagrange coefficients such that uh, my secret S uh, is just lambda linear combination of uh, these shares. So this is the initial idea. We can define the partial decryption as just uh, SI times CT times uh, 0, 0, 001 transpose where SI was the share. And you can define final decryption as lambda linear combination of these partial decryptions. And note that when you simplify it, you just get S times CT times Z01 transpose, and you just, you just get M, M times Q by 2 plus noise. It seems like we are fine. We are good here. We get correctness. But now we note that FHE decryption should just reveal the uh, message and nothing more. In fact, this uh, revealing this noise turns out to be fatal, and it just leads to attacks. So how do we hide that uh, FHE noise? Uh, the idea is that what we can do is uh, perturb these partial decryptions with some further noise in a hope that it will hide the FHE noise. So now we can define final decryption as just lambda linear combinations of these, um, these uh, partial decryptions. But when you evaluate it further, what you get is uh, S times CT times 0, 0, 001 transpose plus uh, a linear combination of noise. But, um, but now we run into correctness issues because this lambda combination of noise is just too big because these uh, Lagrange coefficients can be huge. So correctness is lost. Now we ask how do we fix this noise blow up issue and, uh, how do, and we proceed about this by defining new linear secret sharing schemes with low norm reconstruction coefficients. So there are two ways of, uh, uh, of uh, there are two ways in which we address this issue. The first is by giving a more general purpose secret sharing scheme, which, suppo which supports broader access patterns. And the second is um, we, we, we give a more uh, direct modification of Shamir secret sharing. And this leads to more efficient scheme uh, with shorter keys, but slightly larger ciphertexts. Let me just tell you more about our first approach, which is just uh, constructing a new linear secret sharing scheme with low norm reconstruction coefficients. So let me recall what linear secret sharing scheme is. A linear secret sharing scheme consists of following algorithms. Uh, you can share any secret K, 
and uh, using any access structure to, to give out uh, n shares. And then you can combine a set of these shares as follows. If the set S is qualified, then, then there will exist some uh, computable, effi efficiently computable coefficient CIs such that our secret is just a C linear combination of these shares. And we, now we define this uh, zero one LSS as a class of linear secret sharing schemes where the reconstruction coefficients are always binary. One might ask how expressive is this zero one LSS? It turns out it at least captures the class of monotone Boolean formulas. So let me just take an example of this circuit. Suppose I wanted to secret share this secret K. Uh, so first gate is AND gate. And uh, I want that uh, I want that K should be, re be reconstructed only if you have uh, shares corresponding to both these wires. So what I will do is assign random on one wire and K minus random or the, on the other. Next gate we encounter is the OR gate. So here I want that R1 should be uh, possible to be reconstructed as long as you know shares corresponding to either of them. So I will assign R1 on both the wires. And similarly, I can also handle the third AND gate by assigning random on one wire, K minus R1 minus uh, the, that random on the other wire. So this way we, we know four shares. And note that now secret is just addition of uh, some such subset of the shares. So to answer the question, uh, zero one LSSS at least contains class of monotone Boolean formulas, and it uh, and Valiant uh, in eighty four showed that uh, these threshold functions can be expressed by a monotone Boolean formula. And again, I am reminding you that uh, zero one LSSS uh, the reconstruction coefficients are either zero or one. Let's just now use this idea to fix our problem. So we had defined partial decryptions as SI times CT times 001 transpose plus noise, and final decryption as lambda linear combinations. So now when you evaluate this, you get noise I, uh, the error term as noise times lambda I, but since these lambdas are small, uh, you get M times Q by two plus noise plus small. So this does fix uh, correctness issue. issue. Uh, however, it needs uh, careful security analysis, which I'm not going to talk about, and I will refer you to the paper for details. Now let me just quickly tell you about the more direct approach that we pursue. So this is known as the clearing the denominator trick, and the basic idea is following. If you have any Lagrange coefficient, any Lagrange coefficient lambda is just ratio of uh, products of bounded integers, and you compute this over ZQ. So when you multiply this Lagrange coefficient with n factorial, due to some cancellations, what you get is a bounded integer. And you can show the same thing for lambda inverse. So this is just the basic idea, and uh, we use it to build uh, the scheme. And uh, I will again refer you to the paper for details. Here is a short comparison of uh, the two schemes. So for the first scheme, talks about 0, 1 LSS. Here the ciphertext si size is in poly lambda R and D, where lambda is the security parameter, D is the depth. Size of the par key and the partial decryption is n to the 4.2, where n is the number of parties, and poly lambda D. But again, this is only for threshold access structures. Uh, this scheme is more general, and uh, for smaller and uh, other access structures, it might even be smaller. The second uh, scheme, the size of the ciphertext and the public key is n times poly lambda d. The size of the key and partial decryption is also n times poly lambda d. However, this works for only threshold access structures. Now, given uh, this threshold FHE, how can we address this issue of threshold signatures, for example? Now, suppose Tony wants to sign. He has, uh, he has, he has a setup for the threshold FHE. He can give uh, secret keys to the server. And he gives us encryption of uh, his signing key to all these servers. Now these servers can, using the encryption of the signing key, can compute an encryption of the signature on the message that he wants to compute. And then once you have these encryptions, these, these servers can provide the partial decryption of these, uh, this encryption, and then uh, Tony can combine to get a signature. So this is this exactly is the idea. In fact, we build uh, a no, the notion of universal thresholdizer by capturing this idea. 
However, there are more details and uh, about robustness and all those things which I am not going to cover in this talk. Um, so let me just uh, tell you that this scheme is like directly using threshold FHE, uh, using the idea that I just described. And I will skip the details. Let me summarize our results again. So we construct threshold FHE. We formalize the notion of universal thresholdizer. Then we show that universal thresholdizer is a general tool for constructing threshold crypto systems. Then we construct a universal thresholdizer from threshold FHE. Then this gives rise to uh, various sorts of threshold crypto systems. And many of them were not known to construct from lattices before our work. Also, uh, although like uh, we use very simple techniques, but these techniques have also found use later on uh, in, in uh, follow-up works. Uh, so first, I will talk about this notion of lazy MPC. This is an MPC model where, uh, where uh, honest parties can just go to sleep. So they might, they might be limited in computing power, they might lose connections, and for all sorts of reasons, they, they can just go to sleep. And they are treated differently from uh, corrupted parties. In this setting, we would want some kind of uh, correctness as well as security requirements. And it turns out that this uh, model implies, uh, has a theoretical out outcome, and the outcome is that it leads to first MPC with guaranteed output delivery in standard model in three rounds. And this work uh, is concurrent with another work of Anant et al. However, their work, uh, the focus is completely different, and their assumptions are also completely different. Also, uh, threshold FHE as such has also found use in uh, things like uh, amplifying security. In particular, interestingly, it turns out that using threshold FHE, you can, given any FE or IO candidate with weak security, you can output a fully secure candidate. And this idea appeared recently in, in a work. Okay, so let me just end this uh, with some description of open problems. Uh, we use FHE as a tool to general uh, for to build this universal thresholdizer but can we build this universal thresholdizer from from uh, not relying on the heavy machinery of FHE uh, another way to ask is, is can we give a more efficient construction maybe for uh, more simple classes of uh, functionalities uh, are there more applications of this uh, threshold, uh, threshold FHE and universal thresholdizer and, and another interesting question is, can we get better assumptions? So in particular, can we get this from LWE with polynomial approximation factor? So uh, with this, I would like to just uh, conclude. And uh, I'm, if you want to ask questions, just feel free. <laughs>